Uh, this is an exciting program, and uh, we're fortunate to have it start off with uh, two friends of mine uh, who are longtime friends. Uh, one is a uh, congressman from Kansas. A Democrat from Kansas was about as unique as it used to be a Republican from Florida, because there weren't any uh, in the old days. And he just ran for the Senate in Kansas, uh, didn't make it, but uh, ran a heck of a race, Congressman Jim Slattery. And uh, he has uh, uh, been a member of the uh, Democratic uh, member of Congress uh, going way back uh, to where he was a contemporary of Charlie Wilson's, who some of you may have heard about. Uh, the other member who's going to discuss it is uh, Congressman Bill Zella from New Hampshire. If you look at your political map today, there are no Republican members of the House in New England. Zero. And there's only a couple uh, in the Senate, uh, two senators from Maine in that. So New England, which used to be the rock-ribbed Republican area, is now the rock-ribbed Democratic area, which shows you how things change over a period of time. Uh, Bill uh, has worked on a lot of presidential campaigns and uh, certainly can give you a, a good uh, perspective. My late friends are coming in now as they come gingerly up here. Uh, I won't say anything about the directions they had, probably bad, but uh, how about welcoming the two congressmen? Uh, we're, we're also privileged uh, to have, uh, after uh, the congressman finish, uh, Congressman Alan Boyd. Alan is from a Democrat from the Tallahassee area, and he is a blue dog Democrat. You ever heard that term, any of you? Raise your hand. Blue dog Democrats are basically members of the Democratic Party who are more fiscally conservative than other members. And, uh, there are about 30 to 50 of them, and uh, Alan is the uh, co-chairman of that. And we also have, we're very fortunate to have our new congresswoman, uh, Suzanne Cosmas, who is going to be here. Uh, she has jumped right in. We made one phone call. Uh, she said she'd love to be here. This is her congressional district, and we're certainly fortunate to, to have her uh, as our member and have her already deeply involved in, in the institute, and uh, they'll be speaking next. So let me turn the program over and uh, I'll get out of the way. This was sort of ad-libbing uh, in between. Yeah. Scott? Good. Uh, again, welcome everyone. My name is Scott. I'm a political science professor here at UCF and uh, I've got the privilege to introduce these gentlemen uh, further. Um, we're Congressman Slattery is a former member of the House of Representatives from Kansas, as uh, Lou Fry has mentioned. He was born in Good Intent, uh, Kansas, and uh, I have to believe that anybody born in Good Intent has an advantage in life, I think. Um, he uh, attended public schools in Atchison County. He has a BS from Washington, uh, Washburn University in Topeka, Kansas, and a, and a JD from Washington University Law School, admitted to the Kansas Bar. Elected to the Kansas State House of Representatives and served from 1972 to 78. Elected as a Democrat to the 98th and five succeeding Congresses, and um, and then volunteered uh, uh, retired voluntarily. Um, the Honorable uh, William Zelleth Jr. was a member of the House of Representatives from the state of New Hampshire, as as Lou has mentioned. He was born in East Orange, Essex County, New Jersey. Graduated from Milford High School and has a B.S. from the University of Connecticut. Served in the Connecticut National Guard and the United States Army Reserve. Sales and Marketing Manager for the Consumer Products Division of E.I. DuPont and Nemours and Company. Sub subsequently was an innkeeper, I think, uh, and a small business owner. Mr. Zeloff uh, was a delegate to the Republican National Convention in 1988 and was elect elected as a Republican to the 102nd in the two succeeding Congresses from 91 to 97. And uh, also volunteered retirely, uh, retired voluntarily. Um, today he works as a private advocate. So uh, we're going to start with Mr. Zeloff. Uh, Thank you all very much. Um, this morning we're going to talk about the policy initiatives of the first 100 days of the Obama administration. And Lou, it did not include traffic. I just want you to know. <laughs> but uh, we uh, uh, basically, uh, as a Republican, I want to tell you that I think President Obama uh, has done some really great things for our country. 
uh, the plan, the blueprint that he's put together uh, in terms of what he feels is his vision and what needs to be done is pretty tremendous. It's a big, thick, thick book. And uh, I think he's been given one of the greatest gifts that anybody could get for, as a politician, and that is his gift of being able to communicate. And I, is that, take his ideas and be able to communicate them and get support, I think is tremendous, especially in the crisis situation that we're in. I think also the voters gave him a great vote of confidence as well. And he's got the um, White House, he's got the Senate, he's got the House of Representatives. Um, all he really, he doesn't need the Republicans, our side of the aisle. Uh, he needs to keep the Democrats in full support of what he's done, and he'll have the votes to get almost anything done. Now the hard part is to be able to pass good legislation and make good common sense and uh, do some good things for the country, which he's very capable of doing. Change always sounds good, but the devil's in the details. Democracy is, uh, in the past, has always moved slowly, and it's been done by design for our forefathers, because if you move too quickly, you don't do your homework, you make mistakes, and we don't need to be making mistakes in a crisis situation. Rushing into projects isn't always the best way. Are the proper goals being set, and are they, are they, can they be measured? Will the deliverables be the kind of things that will move the country forward, or will it put us further behind? Does it matter if the next generation, and this is you guys, uh, get to pay for all of our mistakes? And what happens if we end up giving the next generation a reduced quality of life and a lesser standard of living? I would think that the American dream is one that I, with my seven grandchildren, pass on a better opportunity for their standard of living than what was passed on to me, and that's, that would be our goal. As we face the current economic crisis, we can expect our government to do it all, or we can put our shoulder to the wheel and, and uh, practice the slogan that when the going gets tough, the tough get going. We obviously need to stabilize the banking system, and we need to do things that we as individuals are not able to do. The bottom line, at the end of the day, we've got to look down the road and make sure that there are no unintended consequences as we're dealing with a crisis that creates reckless, that is created as a result of reckless abandonment or misuse of the resources we are putting out. Last fall, we took the first step on the road to recovery. Emergency Economic Stabilization Act, or EESA, Troubled Asset Relief, Asset Relief Program, which is Title I or TARP, at the recommendation of Tre uh, Treasury Secretary Paulson, Congress gave the administration full power and responsibility to spend $700 billion of taxpayer money to stabilize the banking system. We can spend all day discussing the pros and cons of how the money was spent, but at the end of the day, does it make good economic sense, and these are questions that I just throw out for discussion, to bail out AIG, General Motors, Chrysler, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and then prop up all nine of our nation's largest banks in a move that some would say partially nationalizes our banking system. The average person would cringe if they knew that Congress gave the administration authority to bail out foreign countries, cities, retirement funds, foreign banks, foreign governments, and others, and the list goes on and on. The bottom line is that this bailout is the largest bailout in history. $700 billion, and this compares to 1990, which isn't too far ago, the loan bailout, the savings and loan bailout then was $120 billion. The American people are carefully watching, as you are, I'm sure, and frankly, they get it, they know what's going on, and they understand it. They have watched two Treasury secretaries look sometimes like goofballs. The bailout bill was written so quickly and passed so quickly that is open to more interpretation than the Bible. Is it any wonder that people on Main Street sometimes get disillusioned? Moving on, we spent another roughly $800 billion on the stimulus bill, and again, we can all spend all day discussing how much was wasted versus the actual money that was targeted to increase jobs, repair our roads, bridges, infrastructure, et cetera. Money spent on SBA loans will create jobs, but money spent in supporting the arts, both in the stimulus package and again in the federal omnibus bill, may not make sense. Nor did the skateboard park in Rhode Island make any sense, in my judgment. So 
Newspaper article from Sarasota area in last, week's, last weekend, officials say Washington is still hammering out details of the stimulus funding, so local plans are in flux. Time is of essence, however, as more families, not just in North Sarasota, but throughout the area, face economic uncertainty. This, in my judgment, has got to stop. Next comes the $410 billion budget bill that funds 10 remaining government departments that didn't get funded last year. That's a $32 billion increase over last year, an 8.3% increase over fiscal 2008. Add the stimulus bill and the omnibus bill together, and you have a $300 billion increase or an 80% increase in the fiscal year spending over 2008. Now that the Easter break is nearing completion, with a couple days left to go, we can look forward to additional spending opportunities. The funding on the war in Af Afghanistan and saving uh, Pakistan, um, along with the work facing us with Mexico, which the President's going to be dealing with this week on the drug cartels, providing affordable, accessible health care to all, um, defining a clear path to energy independence and tackle climate change, invest in cleaner energy, provide energy efficiency mandates, provide protectionist policies, and institute, and this is a big one, a new cap and trade energy program, which some will say is a huge, big new energy tax. Essentially, we'll raise the cost of energy and increase unemployment. We will tax the lifeblood of the American economy, GT GDP losses of possibly $5 trillion, and job losses of 400 to 800,000 are projected by the National Manufacturers Association. Compare what we are now doing with our government, compare it to what we do in our kitchen as we map out our own resources and the monies that we have available to us. Is now the time where we sit around the table and talk about buying a new condo or a second home or a second car or a new computer or this or that? Um, there's lots of different ways to spend money. And I believe very strongly that um, we need to make some very tough decisions. We need to put off things that can be put off. And probably the last thing we want to do with our own money is to spend more money by borrowing more. In normal times, we would chart a path to prosperity for the federal government by lowering taxes. And these are not normal times. Reduce the debt by paying less interest. Start reducing expenses. Reduce the size of government. Prioritize spending based on needs, reform entitlements, Social Security and Medicare, basically start living within our means, and then with what's left, we'll call that disposable income, we can spend money on keeping the government running, our defense, and provide money for, uh, for education. What will happen if we stay the course that we started in the first hundred days? We will grow the size of federal government dramatically, at least around 300,000 people, Debt will become impossible to control. We will need to raise taxes dramatically. Entitlements of two-thirds percent will, of the total budget will continue to grow and squeeze out the remaining one-third of disposable income um, that we need to run our, our government. We will have major inflation. All this leads to the lower standard of living and the wrong path to prosperity. Now, the last thing that I'd like to do, in kind of quick summary here, um, the President did a great blueprint. Let's just call it a book of nine chapters. And those, I'm going to read quickly those nine chapters. And there are three chapters that I would like to add to that book. And I'll discuss them. But the first, first chapter that he's got in his book, the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act, H.R. 1424 of 2008, otherwise known as ESA, Troubled Asset Relief uh, Program, or TARP, which is Title I of that act, the stimulus bill, the omnibus budget, the health care reform, and health care reform at this particular point, the devil's in the detail. If we make health care available across the country to all Americans, how do we pay for it? How is it going to get funded? How is it going to work? We supposedly have the best health care system in the world, and we don't want to replace it with something not as good. Getting out of Iraq now, funding the war in Afghanistan and saving Pakistan are all good initiatives. The challenges facing us with Mexico, the clear path to energy independence, regulatory reform, smart, uh, good, solid regulatory reform of the financial institutions, 
And then those, those are the nine chapters of the president's book that I think are all things that he needs to do and they're on the right track and we're working through those. I think the three chapters that have been left behind are ones that we need to institute now. Save Medicare, save Social Security, bring entitlements in line with what we can afford. In other words, do more with less in order to pay for the things that need to be paid for. Make some sacrifices. They, uh, I think uh, Emmanuel, Rob Emanuel, the President's Chief of Staff said, always utilize a good crisis to accomplish your goals and objectives. Well, this good crisis will people like myself, I'm 73 years old, I'm still working, um, do I need to get Social Security benefits at age 68? We could probably move those along to maybe 70 or 72. I'm willing to sacrifice. I think most people in this country are willing to sacrifice. The next major thing is what about um, chance on, on Social Security where people who do well over their lifetime, even though they put money in the system, uh, don't take money out and, and save the system for people who really need it? It's kind of a crazy idea, but those are the kind of crazy things that we need to be willing to sacrifice in order to make the system work. The bottom line is, are we turning over to you all a better economy and a better uh, America, a better, more prosperous America than the one we received? The question has better be yes. And in order to make that yes, we've got to add those three chapters to the first nine that he started. Thank you very much, and I look forward to hearing your questions. Um, thank you, Lou Fry, for the invitation to be here, and it's a special privilege for me to be here at the University of Central Florida and to participate in this program with my uh, former colleague, Bill Zeloff from New Hampshire. And uh, I want to especially recognize a, a friend who I did not have an opportunity to serve with, but whose leadership I have been inspired by in a number of forms, and that's former Congressman Lou Fry. And uh, Lou, I particularly am impressed with the, the leadership you've provided this institute, and it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Let's give Lou Fry a, a round of applause for the work that he does here at the, at the institute. <clears throat> Scott, thank you uh, very much for the introduction. I am from uh, a community called Good Intent, Kansas, and Good Intent is three miles east of Eden, Kansas, and now you all know where I'm from. But uh, that's up in the northeast corner of Kansas, and I grew up in a small community out there, uh, in a farming community, actually. So uh, from there, I had the honor of representing the 2nd District of Kansas in the United States Congress for, for 12 years. And I look back on that time in my life with, with uh, great fondness and, and uh, a sense of, of honor of having had the opportunity to represent 600,000 people in the United States Congress. But uh, it's a pleasure to be here today and participate in this forum, and it's a real inspiration to see so many of you in attendance today. Uh, I often observe that uh, in America, one of our great pastimes is to come together and complain about politics, right? And politicians, huh? And uh, I'm reminded of this story that I told once about uh, this guy that joined the monastery. His name was Brother Michael, and he joined this monastery, and he had to uh, take the vows of poverty, chastity, obedience, and silence. He can only say two words every three years. So after he'd been in the monastery for three years, the abbot called him in and said, Brother Michael, you've been here now for three years. You can say your first two words. And Brother Michael said, bed's hard. And the abbot said, fine, I'll see you in three years. So he called him in again three years later and said, you've been here now six years. You can say another two words. And Brother Michael said, food's terrible. <laughs> And uh, the abbot said, get out of here, I'll see you in three years. So three years later, he called him in, he said, Brother Michael, you've been here now for nine years, you can say another two words. And Brother Michael said, I quit. <laughs> and, and the abbot said, that doesn't surprise me, you've been complaining ever since you got here. So, so uh, there's a lot of complaining that goes on in America about our political system, and a lot of it is well placed. But I have, remind audiences everywhere that politics in our free society is in the final analysis a substitute for violence. It is in that political cauldron that we call the United States Congress that we work out all the great differences that we have in our society. And uh, it is not a pretty process. I have often observed that it's a little bit like having a family feud around the kitchen table broadcast nationally. 
And that's what you see when you watch C-SPAN and what you see when you watch all the compromising being made as we work out these legitimate differences of opinion so that we can move this great country of ours forward. And in the last election, with the election of President Barack Obama, uh, I think that we turned a historic leaf. Not only did we elect a historic president in a uh, first African-American president, we elected a man who I believe sort of captured the spirit of the moment as presidents in history occasionally do. I think President Reagan did it in 1980. I think President Carter did it in 1976. President Kennedy did it in 1960. And I think we're really looking back on one of these seminal moments in history where we have elected a president with remarkable personal political skills. And when we look back on these last 100 days, I think that we should look first at sort of the task that President Obama confronted. And clearly, our nation was facing the most challenging and threatening and dangerous economic situation that we have faced since the 1930s. And I say dangerous because the conditions that we face today are nothing like the conditions that we faced in the 1930s in terms of the way it is affecting people's lives. But the danger that we face today at the prospect of a collapse of the international financial system, for example, is enormously threatening and dangerous. And that's one big problem that the president confronted. The next big problem that he confronted is the fact that we are engaged in two wars and perilously close to getting involved in another in Pakistan that is also a, a huge challenge just if you were dealing with that issue alone. And then the next thing that he was dealing with is the fact that whether we like it or not, America's standing in the world was perhaps at its lowest point, certainly in my lifetime and perhaps in the history of our country. America was not liked around the world. We were held in contempt in many parts of the world. And, uh, and then there was this sense also that I think was broadly held by the American people that our government was just failing us. It wasn't getting the job done as evidenced by the collapse of our financial institutions and the fact that huge historic corporate giants in this country were collapsing. AIG, General Motors, who in the world would have ever thought a few years ago that General Motors would be bankrupt? Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Lehman Brothers, these huge institutions that have been around for years were collapsing and had collapsed. Well, these were the kind of challenges that President Obama faced. And I think it is fair to say that I don't think any president, perhaps since Franklin Roosevelt, had such a dangerous agenda in front of him. And I think that President Obama should be given strong marks for responding decisively in each of these matters. With his election and with his inaugural address, he did something that I thought was historic and very important. He reached out to the world of Islam in his inaugural address. And he basically said to the world of Islam, if you want to meet us halfway, we'll extend a friendship, hand, a handshake to you, a extend a friend of a hand of friendship. I thought that was a very, very important move on his part because when you look out on the world and your generation is going to deal with the reality that there are 1.3 billion Muslims in the world today. And we have to, in the West, learn how to communicate with the world of Islam. We cannot economically confront the Chinese and be at a war with the world of Islam off in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, or Iran. You can't do both at the same time. So we have to learn to communicate with the world of Islam. I think President Obama made a historic outreach to Islam. And I think it's very significant. The fact that when he spoke before the Turkish parliament a few weeks ago, and he could stand up and say to the world of Islam again, that Americans have been enriched by their contact with Muslims. I know because I'm one of them and he was referring to the fact that he was an American that has been enriched by this contact with the world of Islam. That is historically very, very important. So I think that is a very important uh, uh, step in the right direction in terms of improving our nation's standing in the world of Islam at least. The recent trip to Europe, I believe, was also very significant because even though there weren't a lot of tangible responses in terms of commitments to increase troops in Afghanistan or 
or a lot of money to support that effort. He made a great stride toward improving our standing in Europe and by the fact that he is personally popular in Europe is going to politically help us move those governments in Europe. And I think that is significant. I think the fact that he is reaching out to Russia is important because if we're going to solve our problem in Iran, we can't do it without Russia. The fact that we're engaging Iran, fundamentally changing the policy of the previous administration, I think is very significant. And I think the fact that we are, we are um, approaching the situation in Iraq differently is also important. And President Obama, I think, has wisely sat down with our commanders and, and made this commitment to remove the fighting forces by August of 2010 to focus on Afghanistan. And I would just have one cautionary note, and that is that as he deals with the problems in Afghanistan, we have to be very careful that we don't get sucked into another quagmire in Afghanistan and in Pakistan and we have to be very careful about really defining our objectives and knowing exactly what victory looks like in Afghanistan. When are we going to be able to come home from Afghanistan? And this is one thing that I would really caution our new president on. So in the area of foreign affairs, I would give this president to date very solid mark in terms of changing fundamentally our approach to the world in these very difficult areas. Now in terms of changing the economic situation that he has inherited, I give him again strong marks for being decisive. But I agree with, with my friend Bill Zeloff who said that in the final analysis, I think this president's success will be determined in the economic world about how he is able and whether he is able to deal with these tough issues around entitlement programs. What is the long-term debt situation in this country going to look like? because this is the generational issue that is going to be so important for all of you in this room. You know, my generation, frankly, in, in my opinion, and I've, I believe this strongly when I was a member, this whole notion of running up these huge deficits and this huge debt and passing it on to your generation is what I've called intergenerational robbery. And it really needs to stop. And I think in the final analysis, President Barack Obama's place in history will be determined by whether he is strong enough to lead a real tough political process to fundamentally restructure our nation's entitlement commitments. And they are out of control and they have to be changed if we're going to get our budget under control. And that's sort of the big, big unknown, I guess you might say. So on the area of foreign affairs I've touched on, I give him strong marks there. And in the area of just economic policy, strong marks for being decisive. I mean, you can take issue with the amount of money that maybe is being spent in Washington, and it is a staggering sum of money. But the fact of the matter is he had no other tools to use to stimulate the economy. Historically, presidents were able to, to, to influence interest rates to stimulate the economy. But you know something? This president inherited a, a, an economy where the interest rate was nearly effectively zero. He couldn't stimulate the economy anymore with monetary policy. His only tool left was fiscal policy, and he's done it aggressively. And uh, I think it's too early to tell just how effective that's going to be. The other thing that I am encouraged by is the fact that this administration, and I think the Congress in both parties, is realizing that they made a colossal and historic blunder by deregulating the financial institutions. The passage of things like the Commodity Futures Modernization Act, who in the world's ever heard of that law? 2000, deregulated the financial institutions, prohibited the, C the SEC, the CFTC, and the state regulatory commissions from regulating things like credit default swaps. Who has ever heard of credit default swaps? but they were an instrument, a financial instrument used to really fuel this outrageous speculation that has taken our economy to the brinks of disaster. Why? Because our political leaders in Washington deregulated all of these financial institutions. And I think that this administration and the new Congress is willing to revisit some of those fundamental choices and say, yes, we do need some sensible regulation 
of our financial institutions, and we do need to have a cop on the block, so to speak. Otherwise, we'll have financial chaos, not only in our own country, but in the world. So I give the President some strong marks for, for a willingness to lead in this effort also. I think we are seeing fundamental change in attitudes toward the environment. Uh, the past administration was, their attitude ranged from sort of ridicule to hostility to reluctant acknowledgement of the climate change problem that we're dealing with. And uh, as Bill has suggested, the devil will be in the details in terms of how we ultimately address this global climate change challenge. It's going to take global cooperation. America cannot do it by ourselves. We're going to have to engage the Chinese, the Europeans, and people all over the world. And that's why our standing in the world, which the President, I think, has effectively addressed, is so important. And uh, I think that the administration is going to lead forcefully in trying to enact sensible climate change legislation. Again, high marks there. The administration, I think, is also committed to doing very aggressive things to deal with our dependence on foreign oil, which is hugely important and has been neglected since the days of Richard Nixon. And I think he's willing to step up and say we're going to have to dramatically increase the fuel efficiency in our automobile fleet. I think it's long overdue, and I hope that he's able to, to get that done, but he is committed to doing these kind of things, and this is a fundamentally different direction than the previous administration. So let's hope he's successful on, on these fronts. Why don't I wrap up here and move into the question and answer session, because I find that in these forums, that's the best and most informative part for all of you. So thank you again for the invitation to come here today and share a few ideas on the, on the President's administration. Thank you. Uh, the, it's, it's become a tradition now at the Lou Fry uh, Symposia that we uh, open up the uh, uh, panels to questions from the audience. So I believe there's some folks around with microphones. Uh, can you raise your hands, those with the microphone, so I can see you? Okay. And uh, who's, uh, we, we're, we're running a little bit late, but we're definitely going to have time for a, few, a couple of questions, I think. So who's first? All oh, right, right in the back there, man. Uh, stand up, sir, in the white shirt, please. Morning. Mr. Slattery, uh, you said that there was no other tools to stimulate the economy. Can you comment on how when Obama made the promise that there wasn't going to be any pork when he signed that, that $800 billion, can you, re can you comment on how that pork is going to stimulate the American economy? Um, it should be on. Is this on? Can you hear? Or do you want me to go to the... To the podium. Here. Can you hear? Okay, there we go. Okay. Um, first of all, I, I think you're referring to the, uh, the, the what was called the omnibus bill. It was a it was a package of legislation that, that involved the appropriations of about 400 billion dollars, and in that package, I think there were thousands, 8,000, if I remember correctly, uh -huh. of things called earmarks, and. Um, uh, you know, the president had expressed opposition to the earmarks in the past. And I think he finds that concept uh, still hostile, but uh, I also believe that he was dealing with the practical reality that the Congress inserted these earmarks, and he had a choice when that legislation hits his desk. He can either veto it at a time when the economy desperately needed action and the markets were looking for decisive leadership from Washington. He could have vetoed it and sent it back and said, clean up some of these earmarks. And, and been at war with the Congress from the get-go, I think he made a practical decision. Now let me use this opportunity to talk about earmarks for just a second, okay? I think that this whole d battle over earmarks has been blown completely out of proportion. Completely out of proportion. And I say this as someone I, who- I would agree. When, when I was in the Congress, I didn't get any earmarks because they weren't used that, that, that frequently. And I was on the Budget Committee, and as a member of the Budget Committee, I was always at war with the Appropriations Committee, trying to restrict their spending. So they, they were not inclined to send money to my district. But let me think about this. The question is not so much how much money is going to be spent. That isn't the issue when you talk about earmarks. The money is going to be spent. The issue is, are bureaucrats and members of the executive branch going to have the sole authority 
to determine where the money is going to be spent? Or are your elected members of Congress going to have some say in the location of that money and how it's going to be spent? And you're only talking about probably 2% of the entire federal budget, maybe three, that is spent in earmarks. You can eliminate all the earmarks and you're not going to make any difference of consequence in the size of our national debt or deficit. I had, it's very I had, important that we understand that. So the question is not whether you're going to cut spending so much, which, which should be cut as soon as we get out of this mess we're in, but the, rather the question is who is going to decide, unelected people in the executive branch or your elected representatives? You and decide. The, and the only thing that I would add to it, they need to be transparent. They can't be snuck in the middle of the night. They've got to be hold certain people accountable. The people's names have to be on the bill and the people who are supporting it. Bottom line is things like breast cancer, a lot of our uh, defense mechanisms, a lot of some of the really best ideas that we've got in, this, in, in our country come from legitimate earmarks. So let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Thank you. Uh, one more question, I think, because we're going to try to get this scheduled back on uh, track. So uh, one more. Who's up? Gentleman in the pink shirt, go ahead and stand up. And you have to hustle over there. <laughs> we need somebody, maybe a second microphone, uh, Drew. By the way, while we're getting to the question here, I just want to also recognize Congressman Boyd and Congresswoman uh, Cosmos, and it's a pleasure to be in your districts here, and uh, it's, it's, we appreciate your service in the United States Congress. We sure do. Yeah. So, I had a question for uh, Mr. Slattery, and you discussed President Obama's uh, foreign policy, so I was wondering how you think he handled the uh, North Korean missile crisis issue? <laughs> well, I don't know that um, he had many options. I mean, what is he going to do? And, uh, you know, uh, the bottom line is, is that, that the problem in North Korea is going to have to be dealt with, I think, with the Chinese involved, the Japanese involved, the South Koreans, the Russians. It's going to take international pressure on, on uh, North Korea. But I also believe in engagement. I am one of these people who has rejected this notion that we can isolate our enemies and refuse to talk to them and fundamentally change their behavior. And I didn't mention this, but I am delighted, frankly, to see that the President has, has changed our policy toward Cuba. I happen to believe that it is long overdue, and I know that's a controversial situation. Uh, I would agree with that one, too. Florida, but, uh, it's long overdue, and I, I think it's a move in the right direction. Congressman Zeller, please, would you respond to well, the same question? Well, I, I agree with your comment on Cuba, and, and, and you know, it's like we talk about in the kitchen with our economic decisions. Well, why wouldn't we normally keep our enemies close, keep an eye on them? Why wouldn't we talk with them? You put them in a closet and you're going to cause more problems. So I, I agree. I think we should be talking to Syria and Iran and all of our enemies. We need to keep them close, and that's the only way that we're going to start making some progress. And I think that's a major change in this administration's attitude toward the world uh, compared to the previous administration. And I applaud that, and I give President Barack Obama an A for the willingness to engage. President Kennedy always summed this up very wisely and very uh, correctly, I think, when he said that we should never negotiate out of fear, but we should never fear to negotiate. And, uh, and I, that's the attitude that I want to see this great, strong country of ours take to the world. And if we want to provide leadership in South America, South American countries are encouraging us to do this. Mm -hmm. I don't know about Chavez, but that's another question. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, a round of applause for the former congressman.